here we go. <laughs> I have to pause. Uh, oh, now I lost my ability. All right. So uh, Jennifer wrote in with a question. Lynn wrote in with a question. Uh, Jennifer's question is based around the the George Saunders blog. How many of you guys have been keeping up with that? That's a lot of con I'm finding out that it's a lot of content to keep up with. Julie's been reading it too. She was telling me. Um, Which book? No, the blog. Oh. He's doing this blog over on Substack where he analyzes stories. Yeah, yeah. It's his online class. Yeah, and you have to pay to see the story anal analysis, but he also does office hour posts where he talks about stuff. And he brought up Frank Conroy's reader-writer curve that we talk about a lot. Um, and from there, you have a question, Jennifer? Um, yeah, I, I, I felt like George got into a lot more about um, how do you write for a commercial, how do you, how do you become a commercial writer? I feel like that was the focus of George Saunders analysis of Frank Conroy's thing, but I don't feel like that's your focus. For me, your focus is he's telling you first you got to get meaning, sense, and clarity, and then you move up the pyramid. And so I felt like George was saying sort of a completely different thing. And I just wanted to know what was your take on the whole thing? Yeah. So um, in the Frank Conroy essay that we read, he talks about, I'm going to see if I can pull that one up. Uh, in the Frank Conroy essay that we read, he talks about the, the pyramid and the, um, the reader writer curve the arc. So um, here's the visual that uh, Saunders brings up, which I think is is not entirely. So Conroy's point is that there's reader energy and writer energy. And Conroy talks about a zone that happens in here, but it's actually two different arcs. So this seems like a simplified version of Frank Conroy's thing. Um, but the idea is that like, here, for example, is Finnegan's Wake, where the reader has to put in a huge amount of energy. And I think the writer of Finnegan's Wake is putting in a lot of energy too, but the amount of work that it takes for a reader is a huge amount. So the reader has to put in more, write, more work than the writer. And so based on this, I think you wanna end up in the middle where the writer energy and the reader energy is about the same or is, is enough so that you can really get the the reader in to co-create he's got airport thriller over here where there's not a lot of reader energy but i would disagree and say that readers like putting energy into a book like when i'm reading i like the process of seeing the characters in my head and so i think that with an airport thriller you've got a good amount of writer energy the reader doesn't have to make assumptions or figure things out or narrate or uh, navigate treacherous transitions, but the reader is putting energy in to see the characters and to try to figure out the mystery or something like that. So then he's got your book deciding. So he's using the Conroy arc basically to, to chart one side being like pure art, like Finnegan's Wake, meaning effectively like has no chance of selling. And then pure commerce, like airport thriller, meaning like it's going to sell because it's easy for readers. And he's basing this, he talks about how Frank Conroy came and gave, an, gave an, a discussion when he was in graduate school. Um, and so he's basing it on that. I don't think this is strictly what Conroy is saying, or Conroy revised his ideas later on by the time he wrote the essay that we work off of and when he was teaching at Iowa later um, or when he was head of the workshop. So I don't see how, I, I mean, for let's take the airport thriller. I mean, is he saying that the writer then is putting in more work than if, I, I mean, I don't, I don't quite understand this. I, I get the, you know, how much energy the reader has to put in, 
but I don't think that it's, I, I don't think this is one, just one line. I mean, the writer isn't putting in more work in the airport thriller than he is in Finnegan's Wake, I don't think. I think you're right. And so if we look at, like if we go to Conroy's original idea, which looks like uh, this, they're not, mutu they're not mutually exclusive. So you can have the writer putting in a lot of energy and the reader putting in a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. The point is that you're working towards something where there's a meeting in the middle and the writer and the reader are putting in energy. Um, arguably, James Joyce put more work into Finnegan's Wake than your average airport thriller, but I think he's trying to measure like how much work the reader has to do. Mm -hmm. But in that sense, the, um, the way that Saunders is looking at it breaks down because you're right, it's not more energy that the writer's putting in there. But maybe he would say that the zone is more like over here no, I don't know. I think it's independent. It's not really good for comparing different books. Any any given book has an amount of writer energy that's necessary to really get the reader involved and co-creating, as Conroy talks about it. You know, if you're writing in scene, then as a reader, I can see the scenes and I'm excited by that. But it doesn't mean that I'm just like falling asleep on the couch. I'm, I'm sitting up, I'm reading, I'm co-creating. And I like that. And so with, you know, as you guys have worked with me, usually when we start out, the process is getting more writer energy in because there's gaps there that the reader has to navigate to figure out either what room they're in, what the characters look like, what time of day it is, if we have a sudden uh, scene shift. Um, I was looking at a piece this week where there are a lot of point of view transitions and um, you know, that takes reader work. There's reader energy that's involved to cha change these points of view and figure out like, oh, we're in her point of view, now we're in his point of view. And so there, you know, the writer is still putting in energy, but now the reader has to do more because it's gotten more complicated. Does that make sense? I felt like George was also saying that you, you're making the reader work harder when you have a more esoteric, um, when your your work is more esoteric. And he was talking, I think he was, instead of just talking about energy, I would think he was talking about what is like within the common understanding, like airport thriller, way, way more general and easy to access than Finnegan's Wake. I thought that's what I the thought I, the point, George was making, I thought. Yeah, like for a book like Finnegan's Wake or Sound and the Fury, you have to basically learn how to read that particular book because it's not being, I mean, when we write or when I write and talk to you guys about writing, I'm assuming that you want to hit that reader's sweet spot without having to make the reader come to meet you. And so books that are really challenging, which are you know, it's, it's ironic because the book Lincoln and the Bardo that Saunders was his only novel and actually I think did pretty well commercially. That one was really hard to read. It had like 15 different narrators. He wanted to publish them all in different colors. He couldn't. And it worked really well as an audio book because they had different readers doing different voices. But you know, that one was a really hard read and there wasn't a lot of stuff going on in scene. It's basically like all these voices of different ghosts talking to a dead version of Abraham Lincoln in whatever the place is between heaven and hell or life and death, the Bardo, I don't know, it's crazy stuff. But Saunders talks about how he wants to interact with a reader to keep the reader interested. And then basically says like, I just, I kind of have gotten lucky because I write what I want to write and I've been able to sell it and readers like it. But one of the things that he said that was interesting was that like, he just tried to write a story so that no editor would be able to pull, put it down because new things are happening all the time. 
and he wants them to be interested enough to keep reading. Liz, you want to jump in? Yeah, so I mean, it seems to me like what he's saying is really be aware of what kind of story that you're writing. You know, like if you are writing the airport thriller, it's going to have different conventions and expectations, reader expectations about certain things. And so like I follow a lot of, you know, like self-publishing blogs and Facebook groups and that sort of thing. And one thing that I see a lot is that like reader, you know, say it's like urban fantasy or something like that or paranormal, there's certain things that the readers want in that genre and they get kind of pissed if they're not there. And one thing that see like, obviously that's nowhere near Finnegan's Wake or, you know, other difficult literature, but like they want first person narrative because they like being in the character's head or like whatever. And so when you have something that's more complicated, like Finnegan's Wake that maybe has transition changes or different points of view or whatever, it is going to be harder, but just be really aware of what kind of story that you're writing. Like there's, Airport thrillers are totally awesome. I love them. I read them all the time because sometimes I just want an easily digestible read that goes really fast. Um, and so, you know, just kind of know what type of story that you are writing. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And he talks about how he kind of has gotten lucky that he writes these, he writes these really weird stories that somehow fit into a literary angle and get published in the New Yorker and then are very successful. So he talks about that piece of it too. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, Jennifer. Um, yeah, I think it's all great things to think about. <clears throat> and I just wanted, um, put this out there too, because crawdads is a phenomenon. And I mean, I, I think a lot of writers think it's not good writing, but I feel like what crawdads got was the right engagement between the writer and the reader. And I think um, the other thing about it, it doesn't fit like any genre because it's like, like 10 different genres. And so I think it's kind of interesting to think about and look at as a writer, like, well, how did she do that? Even if, I mean, it's one thing, if you like the story, then it's worth looking at. If you don't like it, then, you know, take it or leave it. But certainly I think it's something, it, it kind of um, just makes you think about it a little bit more. But yeah, that, that answers my question. I, yeah. I like, like all of the thoughts. I mean, I think the, the more you can keep drilling down, I think the, the more interesting it is. And Conroy's um, what, what he had set up to study writing. I think, you know, Lee Child is a really good writer too. And we've looked at some of his work in my workshops. You know, there are expectations book to book and he was doing a book a year for a really long time. I have no interest in reading all of his books, but if I read one of his books, he does it, he does it really well. It's interesting and it's well, well written. There's things to learn there. Trisha? Well, I was just going to say that, you know, I think good writing is good writing and there's different, right. there's different genres of good writing. You know, a lot of people have criticized Stephen King. Stephen King can tell a great story. Is it Ian McEwan? No, but a lot of people don't want to read Ian McEwan. You know, it's so I, I think like going back to your crawdad example, um, of course, it's good writing. Is it complicated? Is it super provocative? Does it make you, ex you know, is it examining the unexamined life? Maybe not but it's still good writing. You know, I think that people get, get confused between those kinds of things. I mean, I, I have a basic belief that anything that is getting other people reading is, has an element of good writing to it. But in something like Crawdads, which actually was to me uh, very provocative. I think about that book all the time and I like big complicated books. Um, so I, I'm, I'm reading a book right now that is, was on the New York Times bestseller list and is so full of sentence fragments that I am about to lose my mind. I'm like, I just want to shake her and say, learn how to use a comma. You know, it, it just, you learn how, learn how to use a subject verb object. Um, that to me is not good writing. 
but yet she's on the New York Times bestseller list. So that's the thing. Well, there are books that are poorly written that are out there and do well. No, you want to know what, what book is, it is? What is the book? I want to know <laughs> the name of it. It's called um, "I Came All This Way to Meet You" by Jamie Attenberg. Mm. Okay, um, and it's a memoir written in essays, and it's her first kind of memoir. And memoir is my sweet spot, so I guess I'm overly critical. But her sent she write her 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 style is to write in sentence fragments, and not in a um, in a uh, Faulkner kind of way. Uh, it is more for effect, and it's it's just so irritating. I mean, it, it's like she didn't have an editor, but yet she did. Yeah. Um, anyway, I don't know why I threw that in because I, I'm sure a lot of people would argue it's great writing, but uh, because it's on the New York Times bestseller list. But to me, well, it's sometimes just- with a book like that, maybe it was a blog phenomenon and then it was really popular. So they turned it into a book. They knew they didn't have to do a work on a lot of work on it because she already had a really strong readership. They just wanted to get it out to press. Mm. And maybe they said at a certain point, like, well, this is our style. Readers respond to it. So we're going to we're just going to roll it out. Huh. I remember about 10 years ago, I, I would just be curious, like, what was her path to publishing it? There might be more of a story there. Well, I mean, this is what's well, this is why I keep, I've continued to read this, the book, because she was a fiction writer. And mm-hmm. so her her big thing is that she decided she was going to be a writer come hell or high water. And so. She literally, after she published her first book, she packed a suitcase and took herself on tour and slept on couches. And uh, she's basically, you know, and, and, and drank and did cocaine and slept with people and, and just had this crazy, crazy, what she considered a writer's life, um, publishing all of these books. And she would say, she says ridiculous to me, kind of offensive book things like, well, my, my second book only sold a thousand copies. And so it was an utter failure. And I'm like, fuck you. I'm, my book only sold a thousand copies and I think it was a rousing success. So she, it, it's, I'm, I, I like that she, is, she has dedicated herself to being, um, being defined as a writer. But in the process, she's kind of given up everything else in her life. That's interesting. I tried Including, that for a while. Not, wasn't, after a point, it wasn't that much fun. Yeah. And traveling I mean, across the country to do all these almost. readings is not cheap. But like mm-hmm. 10 years ago, I read all of those Girl with the Dragon Tattoo books by Stieg Larson. And those had crazy. There were three books. I read them all. I really enjoyed them. Uh, they had crazy narrative uh, point of view shifts out of nowhere with no like transition or like letting you know this is coming. And literally, I swear at least 80 pages out of each of those books should have been cut out. And it wasn't like cut here and cut there. It was like, there's 80 pages at the beginning of this book about a lawyer case or like some sort of really convoluted case. And then the book gets going. And then there was another one. There was like a hundred pages in the middle that like, get so I enjoyed them. They did super well and could have been better. Mm. Here comes Julie. So, you know, one of my teachers said a lot of people get published and you do this work just to make sure that when you get published, your book is well-written and people will appreciate it. And it may or may not find a huge audience. There's a lot of uh, tea leaves and, and other intangibles in that process, but I believe you can control the quality of the writing in your book. And that's one of the few things in this world that we can control. And I see you guys doing a lot with that. Lynn has a question about starting a project. Right, thanks. So I was wondering, um, I'm having trouble coming up with story ideas that go anywhere. So I was wondering if you guys have any uh, exercises you'd like to use or um, practices you use to, to generate ideas. I was thinking about that today, um, Lynn, about how sometimes I feel like I don't, I don't like what I have and I, I want to have a list of prompts that when I'm kind of paralyzed, I can just go to and start writing. Um, and I don't have that. And I thought that would be a great thing for Seth to give us all. Um, so I was gonna put it on his plate. 
Are, are you talking about ideas for stories or what to do when you're stuck in a story? Uh, what to do to generate an idea to start a story. You, know, you pick up the pencil and go, gee, I wonder what I'm going to write about. And I can stare at a blank page for quite a while before anything comes up. So do you keep like folders of stuff that you find interesting, like pictures, uh, articles in, in, uh, online or in a magazine or um, like take pictures? Like I take a lot of pictures of things that I see and I kind of file them away or um, I'll have dreams. I'll write down dreams and I'll put those in my file. Um, it's kind of like a, a, you know, some people call it a compost. I, I don't know if I agree really like that term, but you know, it's kind of like a, some people call it a tickle file. I, I despise that term, but um, you know, it's a, it's a catch-all for the, the stimuli that kind of helps us think or create or feel inspired by um, one area. That's a good idea. Thank you. Are you talking about short stories? Yeah, it, any fiction, like not poetry, but short stories or something that might lead to a novel idea or just someplace to get to get started. Where do you normally start? Do you start with a uh, character or setting or an idea? I've been starting with either a character or um, I'll hear a sentence someplace and go, oh, what a cool sentence. I'm going to use that for, for a, an idea. I've used a lot of autobiographical things, but I'm done with that. I want to move on to something else. You know, it's always... <laughs> Go get on the public bus. I don't know where you are. <laughs> like, go get on trans public transportation and ride around for a while, and you will have a thousand story ideas. <laughs> One per interesting character that you meet on the bus. Yeah. One thing um, that I do is I think about other stories that I like and kind of want to emulate. And then, you know, I think about what you know, maybe the idea is a lot different, but I really want to try a Western or something like that. And so then I think about like what kind of character or set, you know, like the setting or something like that. And then things kind of will organically bubble up that way. And so that, that tends to be helpful for me if I, I'm like, okay, I really want to do a crime story. And then how would the, I, my version of a crime story come up, you know, cause I, you can, with all of us, like you say, do a Western and you would have, you know, every one of us would do something different. So, you know, that's a way to just try something new and see if you like it. Like, I don't even read Westerns, but like, if I had to do one, like, how would it be? Do you have certain themes that, that draw you, Lynn? Or I've sort of, have... I've sort of been, um, doing mysteries or things that are science-based. Um, that appeals to me probably more than something based on a love story, for example, that kind of thing. Woody Allen had this thing. Some people carry a little notebook around. Uh, and one of my friends used to carry around a bunch of three by five cards. That way he could just get, he could put leave the ones that he'd written on at his house so he didn't worry about messing them up but um woody allen had this thing where like every time he had a story idea he would write it down on a piece of paper and just put it in a glass and just leave it in his pocket and then when he got home he would just put it in a glass jar so he'd have a glass jar of these story ideas and then when he was stuck and didn't know what to write he would just go through the jar and find one that he liked another thing that i used to do more recently, my writer's warm up when I'm doing a draft has been to just like get into an empty Word doc and journal or write down whatever feels like it's popping out of my head. But when I was younger, I used to have this, I don't know why I did this, but it felt like it was useful. I would, um, before I, I was writing short stories and before I worked on the story that I was going to work on that day, I think I did this because I was setting a goal of working for two hours. 
and I didn't know what else to do with myself in that two hours. So one of the things that I would do is every time I sat down, I would just start writing anything, no matter what it was, I would just start writing something and I wouldn't stop until I got 500 words. It would be like one full page, single spaced on word. And I wouldn't stop until I did that. And I just did that every day. And most of them I never went back to and looked at. But it was just like a way to sit down and warm up and get the juices flowing. And some of those wound up being useful or good. There's also a book I was like looking around on the internet to find what this book was. There was this book that came out that I used to have. It was written by Christina Katz, who has a good Twitter following and stuff. It was called The Writer's Workout. And it was 366 tips, tasks, and techniques from your writing career coach. And I thought this one had some some good prompts to get you going. There's also that book, What If, that has some good exercises that can get you going um, that I've used a lot. And then I found this one. Uh, this is called A Year of Writing Prompts. And these two guys who are editors at Writer's Digest put this together. Story ideas for honing your craft and eliminating writer's block. Um, can you send those to us? Yeah. I'll put even in, even in the chat, that'd be great. Yeah, can I just put the um yeah. the links in the chat? Yeah, or just the names even. Great. Here come the links. I, um, I've been finding something that Seth said a while ago to be just really profound. And that is you can't write if you're not relaxed. And so I really have been finding that that that's true. And so ways to relax are often ways to find ideas and really let your un, un, unleash your mind, you know? Um, so I've, I've found that to be helpful also, just like the more tense and worried you are. It's like when you have, can't sleep at night, the more you worry about not being able to sleep, the more you can't sleep. The more you worry about not coming up with an idea for a story, the more you're not coming up with an idea for a story, you know? Yeah. That's, That's why so I was sure. thinking that if I had, you know, the, the idea of having like a list of prompts or kind of a, I do this in my house, like when I'm paralyzed and I don't know what to do, I have a list of tasks because I have so much to do. I have a list of go-to tasks. Like if I have no idea where to start with my house, well, I'll go, I'll go clean out my t-shirt drawer because it, it kind of gets you going and it gets you doing something. Um, and I like the, the relaxing thing because I have found that I have rituals now, little rituals for writing. Like I, I like to have either be at a coffee shop with my almond milk latte or be at home with my chai tea and comfortable and sipping my, it's, I mean, it's silly, but it, it really does kind of make me feel, okay, I'm in, I'm in my space, I'm in my zone. One problem that I tend to have kind of like on the same page is that I'm very preoccupied with the end output of what I'm doing. And so if I think that it can't, like the story doesn't have legs or like, I, I always like want like a fully fleshed out concept before I even start. And that can, it's like emotionally constipating. <laughs> like you just get stuck. And so I think one thing that I want to do and I haven't, done it yet but um, I want to just start a daily writing practice where I just sit down and I have to just write even if it doesn't go anywhere because I think that loosens up your mind and loosens up the process and you know you're not so preoccupied with the end thing that you end up with like getting a story as much as just the process of writing whatever is happening and so one thing I don't know how many of you are familiar with the artist's way but you're supposed to do those morning pages where you just like info dump like your laundry list and your to-do list and all the shit going on in your life that's like clogging up your mind so that you get that out and then you can actually start doing something productive because my mind is like going hundred miles a minute on, you know, like, oh, I forgot to pick up milk. I forgot to do this, you know? And so if you just get that out of the way, then you can actually just free up some, some more of the process. The morning pages thing is like supposed to be three pages, though. Like when I was doing that thing to kind of dump all the surface level stuff of my head, uh, I just would let myself know like, OK, this is the time that I'm ready to switch over to fiction. 
and it was useful and it wouldn't be three pages worth of stuff because I didn't want to spend that much time on it. But it was like, I just get this stuff down and then I know um, I'm ready to shift to something else. Yeah, what's the book that the morning pages is from? The Artist Way? Yeah, The Artist Way, Julia Cameron. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Um, I'm also a really big believer in the idea of the triggering subject and the generated subject. Um, and you guys have probably read that Hugo essay that I've shown you. And, you know, some of my books, like I literally wrote the Maltese Jordans, starting from the idea that I wanted to write a short story set in Kauai so I could write off my Christmas trip. And it turned out to have this be this whole different story about sneakers that ended up going to New York City and San Francisco and all this stuff. And um, I really believe that, like, if you're writing consistently, no matter where you start, you'll find a story and then you reach a point where you don't know what's going to happen next. And there's fear from that. And that fear can be paralyzing. But you guys probably know by now that I push you to like lean into that fear and and it it can the flip side of that is that you have that uncertainty of what's going to happen next that's exciting similar to the excitement that you have as a reader and you can write to the place where you just keep going each day to find out what's going to happen next and that can be a really fun way to to get a book out and to write a story and to find your story have any of you gone through that and want to speak to any successes you've found? I've really found the triggering subject is the, the main, main way that I move forward when I'm stuck. Um, you know, I, I, a lot of the ideas that have come up have been things I've tried and, and I think the most successful ones I've had are sort of a combination of, um, well, I, I usually go to a, um, either a coffee shop or, or a McDonald's, McDonald's are really good, um, and watch the people. And then like, like Liz, I kind of have an idea of what kind of story I want to write. And then I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to put these people in the story. And if it's a mom and kids, or if it's a guy with a baseball hat or whatever, it helps me visualize them so I can get the words on the, the visual words on the page. And then usually when I start writing, it just, that just, you know, so it gets something on the page and it just takes over it just kind of goes from there and you you start and you just kind of let it flow and and it's it's amazing what comes up because it, a lot of stuff I write up was nowhere near in my head when I started it it just kind of came out of some subconscious well <laughs> that it, your mind mind once you and it, it is kind of a way of relaxing when your mind relaxes in that way it just this stuff comes up and it comes out on the page and it, it's it, it's really kind of it makes writing a whole lot of fun once you get into that at least i found it that happened and kind of rewarding too as a meditation in my experience mm -hmm. and you like i want to tell your story julie like you basically were working on finding a story that you wanted to write you wrote this chapter or a start of something based on a run a fictional run that someone was taking in or in Washington state. And now you've literally just finished a whole mystery novel about a murder and a police officer solving this case. And it's like, you know, it basically came out of magic, just sitting and writing. Yeah, I never would have imagined that I'd have come up with, it. you know what, I, I, I didn't, I could never see where the story was going until it went. Yeah. And so it was kind of terrifying because I never knew if I was going to be able to finish it or not. And then, but eventually the process kind of works. So that's, I mean, that was for me, was a big, um, lost the word, but anyway, it was a, it, it was a big sense of, of, um, trusting the process and learning to how to trust the process. I and I think sometimes is, when you're blank, staring at a blank page, it's really hard to trust the process. Life can be like that. It's like you fear comes and you can either like let it lock you up or you 
you can look at it and say, well, if I'm afraid of this, there must be something to learn there or something that I can accomplish. And so you lean into it and try it and then something great comes. How about some of you that haven't had a chance to, to talk? Do you have experiences or, or things you wanna add? The brilliant novelist, Gail Massey. Yeah, that's all I needed to hear. I gotta go now. <laughs> I had a um I was doing an online class during COVID and they the prompt was take a look around your office and write a story about a thing you see. And I ended up getting a really great essay about my mother. Um, because what I saw it was this little birdhouse that she gave me years ago. And that was the entry point into the essay that I wrote about her, which was, um, you know, about our relationship and the, um, the birdhouse was sort of like the container for, for all of that. It, I don't normally look for prompts, uh, but that was, that was a pretty sweet one. Ended up nice, uh, ended up with a nice essay. It's funny, every time I every time I do a prompt in a class that I'm teaching, sometimes I'll do it myself. Like if we're just going to write for 10 minutes with a given start. If I, everyone who does it and I do it, something comes out on the page that I have never I wasn't thinking about at all. I have no idea where it came from. And it just winds up being a thing that gets written and comes into the world. Yeah, I generally don't like prompts because um, somehow it, it seems like, I don't know, limiting or something. But I did take this during COVID, this um, class through Clarion West. It was like one of their like one day workshop things. And um, it was on generating ideas for, for speculative fiction. And, you know, I know a lot of us don't write speculative fiction, but I thought the prompts were pretty interesting. It was like one of them was, um, taking metaphors and making them literal. So if you have like a heart on the sleeve, like what would that look like? And so thinking about language in that way and like teasing them out because you take a lot of things for granted, right? Like we don't think about, you know, we use a lot of euphemisms and metaphors and language. And so like really, really like honing in on what that would look like. And then um, another one was just having like, you know, you, and I used to do this too, you take tickets like Movie, like movie ticket stubs and you just write words on them that you like and put them into a jar and then you pick two of them and so you just try to like match two and see what comes up and so it would be you know like avenging angel or whatever and then putting those together and seeing what kind of story comes up so I, whenever I tried to do something like the ticket stub thing, I ended up just spending all this time like writing words on ticket stubs and then didn't actually like, do anything with it. But uh, it's kind of a cool concept at least to like be thinking about writing in a different way even if you're not actually writing. I think, I think you know, my, my biggest piece of advice around this would just be to give yourself permission to write something that's not brilliant give yourself permission to write something that's not perfect and not don't worry about what it's going to be. It's like I had this sign by my computer that just said make a mess. And so it's like if you just go in with the practice that you're going to write 300 or 500 words a day and give yourself permission to make a mess. I really believe that pretty soon it, something will start coming out of it and making sense and calling to you and being something. It's like in that essay on revision, Coke talks about you're really, your first draft priority is just to make the clay. And then when you have this big ball of clay, you can see what the story is in it and you can cut it out, but you just have to make the clay. 500 words a day about anything. And pretty soon you're gonna find something that you keep coming back to. Like that. Yeah. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. Does anyone have another question? A 
something you want to talk about? I listened to that podcast. Do you want me to listen? Oh, to that? that's good. Yeah. I could put a link to that in the um, in the notes. What did you think of it? Did you like it? It had nothing to it do was, with writing. Um, well, kind of. I mean, it did make me feel like everything I say is completely irrelevant. Um, so that was a bummer. Oh. But I, because it, it, I, yeah, I don't know. I thought maybe everybody had read it, listened to it. No, I only sent it to you because I thought, it was i was thinking about you when i was listening to it there was a thing it was like i can put a link in it to it in the show notes and it's funny because it's this writer resma menicum who i really like and he's talking to this woman amanda seals that i thought was really smart and then i googled her and i turned i realized that she plays this super annoying character on a tv show that i've watched and now i'm like i don't it's not her she's not that character i know but that character was so annoying that now I don't know if I can, but I like her anyway. So she was just talking about, they were talking about when you wake up in the morning and your alarm goes off, what's oh. the first thing that you do? Do you put your feet on the ground and get going? Or do you just like lay there and feel the desire to get going? And she was saying, you know, and she's a woman of color. She was saying like, it's, she lays there and waits. And for a lot of people of color, that's very rare because they have this feeling like I'm under it. I got to go, go, go. And so I like that, that they talked about the, the experience of kind of being in a moment and letting yourself pause. Sometimes Resma is really big on pausing and sometimes just pause and sort of let things sink in. So much of what we're going through is like, a stream of consciousness, a stream of different things running through our heads. And what I really like in fiction and in, in the fiction where things are really slowing down is like, I can see a character's world where the character is present in the moment. We talked about this a long time ago, Liz, about how it was like a character's superpower was being present in the moment. And so it's like, if you slow down the narrative, you can see a character who's really grounded and like seeing what's going on around them and for a lot of us, that's a rare experience. Like we have lives where we're just like, boom, 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 a to-do list, or if I'm going to, you know, all these things. And so it's another thing about Lee Child. Like when Reacher gets into a fight, everything slows down. And it's like, he sees the way the guy is going to kick him and he sees the punch coming. And it makes you feel like as you're reading it, like, wow, this guy's a really good fighter because it's like, he understands the whole thing. Like if you talk to a really good basketball player like they see the whole game happening and if you talk to a basketball player that knows nothing they're like i don't know the ball came i pat i just had to get rid of it and so it's like now i've used a lot of examples and i lost my thread but um there's a perfect example of it is like you know pausing is something that we can offer to ourselves to let us appreciate the moment slow down it's like these grounding exercises um that one of you guys was mentioning about getting relaxed that you were talking about now getting relaxed and then writing from that point when we can write characters who really know their world and are aware of it that's attractive for readers because it helps them slow down and so giving ourselves that permission to slow down the woman's name is Amanda Seals, and she was talking about, she and Resma were talking about how this is really a part of self-care. Is like, you know, there's crazy stuff going on in the world. We have all these things that we need to do in our lives. And, you know, you don't have to do like a 15-minute meditation three times a day. But if you just like give yourself a moment to pause... things start to happen and come up and it's like the act of being present takes us to a different place. Yeah, I think so when we talked about that, it was like with my writing where a lot of what I end up doing is like, I'm looking at it from a God level and trying to like manipulate the situation from way too high up. 
I, you know, I want to like plan everything out and know where I'm going and that sort of thing. But then when you sink down into the scene, I think just what Julie was talking about, it's like scarier because you don't know where you're going. But like, you can all take some inspiration from Frozen, um, do the next right thing is like how you get your characters to like figure out. So I'm, I'm reading this book on like thriving during uncertainty because I feel like everything in my life is like crazy. Mm -hmm. And then it was saying like, you don't need to know the answer. You just need to know what the next step is. Yes. I feel like that's what we can do with our writing is like, you don't need to have an entire thing planned out, you know, just do the next right thing right now. Yeah. That's what Hemingway said. Just write one true sentence. And Richard Ford said something similar. And it's like, yeah, you don't need to know the whole book. You just need to write one good sentence and then write another one. And it helps at the end of the day if you have an idea what the next sentence is going to be, or you know what's happening in it, but yeah, you can literally just do it one sentence at a time. I think there's also something to be said for I, the stillness and the pausing, but also getting up and getting your blood moving. Who's that writer, Lisa Scottolini, or somebody who writes like on a treadmill? Oh she just pumps this, stuff, <laughs> pumps this stuff out and she writes it like on her treadmill, you know, and she said it really helps with her, her brain functionality. But I think that's true. I'll find sometimes I've been I'm sitting for a couple hours and I'm like, I'm, I, I'm not getting anywhere. If I get up, I go for a walk. I run around. I lift weights. You know, you do something that gets your and then you're you come up with fresh ideas. So, I mean, they're sitting and there's movement and they both can sort of contribute to the creative process at different junctures. And the trick is knowing when, when you need to sit there and just struggle through it and when you really need to get up and do something else. I like that. I think it's important to move your body at least twice an hour when you're writing. You can't just sit there. I have a desk that goes up and down. I'm standing right now. And for some reason, I don't feel comfortable writing fiction standing, um, but I can zoom standing up. <laughs> and some people like dictate their things into, you can also like dictate a book into your phone and then upload it to the internet and someone will transcribe it for you. I was listening to a guy's podcast and he was saying that he writes like that. I, I want to do that and it, I can't do it. I can't get my head around it. I can't do it either. I'm it's really I'm really admiring of those people that can do that. I just no way. <laughs> no way could I do that. But I have to say too like one of the things that I like about writing is the process of being engaged and writing one sentence at a time. And I think that's why I like writing fiction. And so, you know, why would I take away the part that I like of it? Um, I just ordered the um, the uh, writer's workout techniques. It's five dollars on Amazon right now. It's a good deal. Yep. Yeah, Christina Katz has a pretty good web presence. She was um, connected with. She's connected with uh, the folks at Writer's Digest pretty well. She's like a. She's in the Jane Friedman world. If you, um, I know some of you guys have logs with me, and if you do, I've probably put some grounding exercise links in them. Uh, I think having grounding exercises can be good, but it can either even just be like the breathing stuff that we do at the beginning of a meeting. Yeah, I like that conversation that we had about being present as like a character superpower. Yeah, it's cool. The character that feels like they're at home in that weird situation, like that's the character that we want to read about. Like something crazy is going on and there's a character who is handling it. Like that's the interesting thing. And to do that as a writer, we need to slow down and do that mental work of, of visualizing what the character is doing, picturing that and then writing that. And sometimes that's a new muscle to, to work out. But when you get good at it, I think it's pretty rewarding. So 
So that's where we are for today and for this month. I want to thank all of you guys for showing up. It's really good to see all of you guys. It turns out the third Thursday in August, um, I'm away. So we'll try to do a different Thursday uh, for August and we'll be back for September. And yeah, it's really good to see you guys. Um, can we, should we do a, yeah, hopefully that helped. Was that helpful, Lynn? Yes, it was, and I really appreciate everybody's responses. I want to get. I, I want to see list. you. I want to see you writing again. I want to see another Lynn book. No, got to get going. Yeah. So, um, thanks, everybody. Let's do. I'll turn off the recording.